Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our fifth annual showcase. We're really happy to have you here. My name is Jenny Close. And my name is Matthew Valley. Um, thanks for coming. Go ahead and take your seats. Yeah. So anyway, welcome. Thank you for joining us um, for the 2018 uh, Showcase Symposium. Um, so this is where uh, every year we sort of celebrate the advances we've made over the past year, um, share our new data and insights, and provide an inside look um, at some of the teams and some of the processes that make our approach to science work here at the Allen Institute. Um, we'd also like to thank, before we move on, the Showcase Committee, uh, the team of um, volunteers internally who have uh, spent countless hour hours over the past year helping organize this program. Um, and I'd just like to have them all stand up, um, everyone who's listed here, uh, and let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> no, <it's coming> up. <laughs> These folks uh, worked really hard over the past several months to put together a great program today. Um, so over the next two days, um, you'll have the opportunity to hear about ongoing work um, during team talks, um, which is sort of a unique talk format that we have here at the showcase, um, where a few selected internal teams highlight their work um, and the results. Um, now, you're only going to hear from some of the teams um, that are actually active within the Institute. Um, you should be able to gain a reasonably complete picture of all the activities at the Institute if you also go to the posters. So that's you know, where, where many of us who are not in a team talk will, will be talking about our work. Um, and, and just talk to internal scientists. And we have a huge level of participation in both talks and posters. Um, so we would also like to thank everyone, uh, all the internal scientists who put in so much hard work to to be here today. All right, so the team talks um, are roughly uh, organized according to our um, sort of institute programs. Uh, we're sort of generally binned into sort of three programs in the institute, um, which we call the cell types program, uh, which sort of studies the, um, the, the building blocks of the brain, what type of cells are there in the brain. The brain TV program, which roughly is a program where we build physiological atlases of brain activity and try to uh, correlated with animal behavior and other relevant states, and the product program, which um, helps sort of uh, package all of these types of data into the sort of uh, world-facing products that we put on our website. Um, so you'll hear um, three talks uh, from the cell types program having to do with tra transcriptomics, connectomics, and uh, whole brain 3D morphology. Uh, two talks from Brain TV, um, looking at uh, cortical thalamic uh, interactions and um, uh, analysis of our two-photon brain observatory data, and then a product talk on a sort of trustworthy software engineering. And then, of course, as I said, um, after every day, starting at 3 o'clock, we'll have posters um, around the atrium. And uh, we strongly encourage everyone to go and, and look at all the great things that are, that are there. During the symposium, you'll also meet our newest class of next generation leaders. Um, these emerging leaders in the field were chosen through a highly selective process from a talented international pool of applicants to advise our scientific program and to inspire us through interaction and collaboration. So please welcome Keith Hangen, uh, Assistant Professor at Washington University in St. Louis, Emily Silvestrak, Assistant Professor at the University of Oregon, Tom Nowakowski, Assistant Professor at University of um, California, San Francisco, Mark Sombrowski, Assistant Professor at the University of British Columbia, Catherine Pena, Assistant Professor at Princeton University, and um, a new next-gen leader who unfortunately couldn't make it um, to this symposium, but Maria Antonieta Toshis, a postdoc from the Max Planck Institute um, for Brain Research. We, we look forward to interacting with her at, um, at future events. We'll also be hearing, so from from this newest class, we'll be hearing um, research talks from them, 20-minute research talks that are scattered throughout the symposium program. From, um, from the, from the second-year second class of Next Gen Leaders, we'll be hearing lightning updates. Um, I just want to point out that the, some of the lightning updates for today have been moved up to right after the break. That's a slight schedule change. Um, and from our third-year Next Gen Leaders, uh, they will be leading roundtable discussions, so we encourage you to um, participate in those discussions. It should be a good way to interact with our next-gen leaders and for them to interact with scientists at the Institute. So 
On a final note, this year we were excited to put together a program that featured the knowledge that is being built at the Institute as our programs come to maturity and we, um, we turn our data into lasting insights into brain composition and function. At this 15 year mark, there's a lot to look forward to and a lot to look back on at the same time. And um, this year, as we honor the legacy of Paul Allen, we thought the theme of lasting knowledge was a fitting one um, and a fitting focus, as there could be no greater legacy for the, um, than the immense body of knowledge that Mr. Allen sought to create to drive science forward. And with that, we'd like to um, welcome our president and um, chief scientist, Christoph Koch, to help us kick off the showcase symposium. Thank you, Jenny and uh, Matt. If you want to go fast, go alone, run alone. If you want to go far, walk together. So you've often heard me say this uh, proverb because it's really at the heart of what, uh, what makes us tick. It's really the beating heart of the Allen Institute, whether that's the Allen Institute for Brain Science or, or, um, or Cell Science. It's all about um, a team, team and groups. And they are, uh, as you all know, because you're all part of one or many uh, different teams at different times, um, putting, um, assembling teams and putting them together and making them work is, um, is, uh, is a challenge. It's very different. It's something we're not taught at, at universities at all because they're the, uh, they're the teams are very small. Typically, you know, your PI and, uh, and a postdoc and a, and a grad student or, or a couple of undergrads. And here, of course, we have teams that, that, that range from 10 to maybe 100 people total. Um, and that imposes its own dynamics and, and, and challenges. And um, uh, I was interested, I, I like, like many of you presumably, didn't really know much about it when I came here and I had to learn baptism by fire. And um, recently I was, uh, uh, I was um, moved to look a little bit into the psychology of it. And there's quite a bit of organizational psychology around the, the, the topic of, um, of group dynamics, since it's obviously key for the performance of institutes such as ours, for industry, for the army, for armed forces, anywhere where you have more than, than you know, two, three, four people that have to work together. And um, the, the, um, the idea I found most interesting is um, organizational psychologist from the 60s and 70s, um, Bill Tuckman, he was at the um, University of Ohio, and he has this sort of four states model of, uh, of team development. And I think it resonates well there. There are lots of other models. This is sort of, a, I would call it still a, a soft science. There are lots of different organizational schemes, how team gets together. This one, I think, is, is helpful and certainly resonated with me in my, um, my years here at the Allen Institute. So this is the first stage of, uh, of forming teams. When a team meets and learns about the opportunities and challenges and agrees on the goals and begins to tackle the uh, and the task at hand. Team members tend to behave uh, um, early on quite independently. Um, uh, they may be motivated, but they're relatively uninformed about the issues and objectives of the team. Team members are on their best behaviors, but focus on themselves and what they can contribute and what, 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 um, uh, what they can get out of the team. Then forming, storming, brainstorming. The group starts to sort itself out and gains each other trust. Participants form opinions about the character and integrity of others and feel compelled to voice their opinions if they find someone shirking responsibility or attempting to dominate. Sounds familiar? Uh, now, of course, what, what, could ha what also happens, what, we've, uh, what I've observed, what's sort of more insidious, when people do have strong opinions about other people that shirk responsibility or, or dominate something inappropriately, that they don't um, voice it or that they voice it only among themselves, which can really be detrimental. So key to the successful formation of, um, of teams, um, large teams of the ones of the sorts that we need here is really communication, open communication, that such is, um, issues be discussed not behind other people back, but to the extent possible by the group as a whole in an open environment. Norming, so normalization, uh, when sort of um, uh, agreements and personality clashes has been normalized. So this results in a, in a greater degree of intimacy. People are much more comfortable with each other and the spirit of cooperation emerges. People start tolerating the whims and the fancies of the individual team members. You know, everybody's a little bit of an oddball and you get used to the styles of your, of your colleagues. 
And then finally, uh, performing with group norms and roles established, group members focus on achieving common goals, often reaching an unexpected high level of success. Descent is expected and allowed as long as it's channeled through means acceptable to the team. So what's really essential besides communication is trust. You have to trust your, the members of your team, you know, whatever level of organization uh, they are. If they're part of the team, you really have to trust them. And you, you, have, to, you have to, and it's easier said than done, um, you have to assume that just as you are, are part of this team and, and, and sort of you, you have the, the, and the best in, uh, inter, um, the best interests of the group in mind, you should also assume that others uh, um, have that, um, rather judging them based on your feelings that they are sort of at best incompetent, at worst um, malevolent. So trust, communication and trust. Now I've, said that, um, I've, I've given the, the next three slides before and all staff, several probably in 2014 when probably half of you weren't here yet. So. Um, a good way to epitomize that is by rowing, a sport many of us engage in here just outside, particularly on a beautiful day like this, rowing in, a, in an eight or in a quarter, in a double or in a single. And uh, I'm just uh, pulled three quotes from this wonderful book, the bestseller. I think it's being turned into a Hollywood movie, The Boys in the Boat, which uh, takes place here locally at the UW in, 19, in, the, um, in the years of the Depression, 32 to 36, when um, when a UW team of um, our um, undergrad team, um, eight plus a Cox and nine, um, came together and um, performed as a team and finally excelled. Um, it's a very moving, it's a historic book and a, it's a very moving book. And um, here they talk about the, um, the team composition and what's of relevance really here is the second half of, the, of this quote. Great crews may have men or women of exceptional talent and strength, they may have outstanding coxswains or stroke oars or bowmen, but they have no stars. The team effort, the perfectly synchronized flow of muscle, oars, boat, and water, the single whole unified and beautiful symphony that a crew in motion becomes is all that matters, not the individual, not the self. And you, we can really apply this to the Allen Institute. We can replace it. Great crews, you know, great teams may have a man and woman of exceptional talent and strength and scientific ingenuity and, and energy and, and enthusiasm and organizational talent, but they have no stars. It's really the team effort that counts. And we are only as strong as sort of the weakest link. So, so just like in rowing, we have to synchronize with each other. We have different styles, we have different backgrounds, we have different ways of dealing with adversity, but we all have to work out these, uh, these issues on the assumption that we are all in this for the, for the greater good. Uh, <clears throat> and this is on the topic of trust. So this is uh, two rowers talking, uh, the, 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 the coach talking to the, um, the, the rower. He suggested that Joe think of a well rowed race as a symphony and himself as just one player in the orchestra. If one fellow in an orchestra was playing out of tune or playing at a different tempo, the whole piece would naturally be ruined. That's the way it was with rowing. What mattered more than how hard a man rowed was how well everything he did in the boat harmonized with what the other fellows were doing. And a man couldn't harmonize with his crewmates unless he opened his heart to them. He had to care about his crew, his team. It wasn't just the rowing, but his crewmates that he had to give himself up to, even if it meant getting his feelings hurt, as it can be, we all know, during, um, during uh, team dynamics. And then finally, because it's also a thing of great beauty, I wanted to, to end this part uh, with, uh, with this quote from the end of the book, it was when he tried to talk, so he is uh, the, the, one of the uh, rowers, it was when he tried to talk about the boat that his word began to falter and tears welled up in his bright eyes. At first I thought he meant the husky clipper, the racing shell in which he had rowed his way to glory. Or did he mean his teammates, the improbable assemblage of young men who had pulled off one of rowing's greatest achievements? Finally, watching Joe struggle for composure over and over, I realized that the boat was something more than just a shell or its crew. To Joe, it encompassed but transcended both. It was something mysterious and almost beyond definition. It was a shared experience, a singular thing that had unfolded in a golden sliver of time long ago when nine good-hearted young men strove together, pulled together as one, gave everything they had for one another, bound together forever by pride and respect and love. Joe was crying, at least in part, for the loss of that vanished moment, but much more, I think, for the sheer beauty of it. 
So I think if we fast forward, if we let the years accumulate into decades and we look back uh, on our light, you know, later on at this period of our life when we spend our time and energy and enthusiasm here, I'm not sure we're going to cry about the beauty of the Allen Institute, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll appreciate that what we're doing is extraordinary, is very different than anything else that happens on the planet, and we are all of doing this in the service of, um, of something greater, right? trying to understand, trying to understand and heal, trying to understand the most complex piece of highly organized matter in the universe. And this is what this, uh, this is how they excelled. So this was in 1936 in Berlin at the Olympic Games in front of uh, Hitler, who actually attended this, because he was hoping the Germans would win. But you see on the, on the back, the, the first row, that's a Husky Clipper. The, the second one, silver, is, uh, are the Germans, and the Italians are the third. So that's, that's what they achieved. You dub students. All right, then I wanted to show how far we have gotten in this, you know, following this motto, if you want to um, uh, go fast, run alone. If you want to go far, walk together. So this is uh, what we had set out uh, seven years ago. So this is what Alan and I then took to, uh, to Paul, but this was before sort of the 10-year plan was approved. So, you know, cast your mind back, 19, uh, uh, 2011, uh, first year first turn of the presidency of Obama. Um, we propose to build a computerized suite of behavioral techniques to train and evaluate murine, I mean, mouse visual motor behaviors. So we've done that successfully, the change detection paradigm. We wanted to build a series of high, we had planned to build a series of high throughput observatories to record under highly standardized conditions from fixed, uh, head fixed behaving mice. And we uh, specifically envisioned uh, four different observatories. One is sort of, we don't really call it an observatory anymore today, but the um, electron microscopic observatory to reconstruct part of V1. And of course, that's what we're doing. Uh, Clay and Nuno and their team, the cubic millimeter uh, project. Um, we want to, so this is a project mind scope is specific to, uh, to mouse. A project mind scope, think about it as cell type specific to, uh, to mouse and then, and then brain TV. Uh, we wanted to build an electrophysiological observatory listening to spikes using silicon probes with 1,000 to 10,000 channels, as you'll hear shortly in the, uh, one of the next group talks. We've done that, and we're doing that routinely with 6,000 channels. Wanted to build calcium observatory, two-photon calcium imaging observatory to record from genetically identified neurons in behaving mice, which we're doing. Um, and we wanted to, to uh, I termed it uh, uh, brain TV. So the origin of the main name brain TV uh, is something that Francis Crick and I discussed and written about, I don't know, 30 years ago or so. The idea, if you think about uh, cortex, like the cortex of a mouse, 14 million neurons, so think about a TV screen with 7,350 pixels across and 7,350 pixels um, down, so that's, half, that's 14 million pixels for every neuron one pixel. And the challenge we have, if we want to understand what's going, if we want to read the, mouse, the mind of the mouse and try to infer what's going on, is think about you're watching a movie, you know, any movie. And rather than seeing the whole screen, all you see is a, is a few pixels, like 10 or 20 or 50 pixels, which certainly was the state uh, back in 2011. And you're trying to infer the underlying action. You're trying to infer who does whom to what, and you know, who backstabs whom and all that thing. You're trying to infer just from looking at a pixel here and a couple of pixels here and a couple of pixels here. So here the plan was, we're on our, our way to achieve that, to record from very large fraction of the movie screen, if you want, in this metaphor. We wanted to get a, a near complete description of all, or all, almost all cell types and their projection in cortex and in associated satellite structure, particularly the thalamus, the, the uh, basal ganglia, and the, uh, and the claustrum. And uh, once again, we'll have a team talk on that. I think we've achieved, uh, we're, we are uh, close to achieving that. We wanted to use uh, Cree driver lines and other optogenetic tools. Um, to inactivate, in, uh, inactivate and activate certain cell classes. We're using slightly different techniques than the techniques that were popular in 2011. We wanted to integrate all that data into the Allen Brain Atlas and make this publicly available, which of course uh, we, we've done, continue to do. We just released uh, the web-based um, uh, Brain Viewer. I uh, want to have a modeling observatory, a large-scale open access uh, modeling facility. So that's really BMTK, the Brain Modeling Toolkit that we released. 
and we wanted to, to develop or we plan to develop open standards for recording and analysis. And that's, of course, the new data without borders that we were heavily involved in, in, um, in launching. So that's what we planned uh, seven years ago. I think by that measure, we've done pretty well. And then the last slide I was going to show is just a summary for those of you who are not aware of what goes on at the Thai Institute, in one slide um, of some of our major achievements. Now, I'm, I'm limited to one slide. I didn't want to have multiple slides. I didn't want to bore you too much. Uh, so it's just a select view of certain of, certain of, the, of the accomplishment that we've done over the last uh, 12 months, the scientific accomplishment. So uh, we've obtained gene um, expression profiles from roughly 100,000 cells over the last year from the, uh, the um, Kim's um, transcriptional pipeline using very deep sequencing, and then close to 2 million, almost uh, 15 times more, uh, single cells using a different, uh, a different technique that's somewhat shallower, uh, either single cells or nuclei from both human and, um, and mouse brain. We started off doing this back in 2000. Well, the pipeline officially kicked off in August of 2015, but the single cell transcriptomics goes all the way back to 2013 when we did a couple of thousand cells. So now we're doing sort of almost two million of them. So as part of that, we discovered um, uh, in, the, in the mouse that inhibitory neuronal cell, the, uh, cell types, the GABAergic, the interneurons, and the non-neuronal cell types, they're relatively comparatively preserved across different cortical areas while the excitatory cells that primarily provide the, the output both to other parts of the uh, cortex as well as uh, other parts of the, of the brain, they differ. They're unique to different regions. And that many cell types can be matched one-to-one -one between uh, human and, um, and mouse. So even though there might be lots of specialization, you can, re you can still find sort of matches, partners between a mouse and a human, although their last common ancestor is about 60 million years ago. Uh, and e you can find these matches even though individual marker genes diverge. We published um, major papers uh, this year and, and, and more coming. So we published, uh, of course, our two big, um, um, together with, um, one of them was together with, uh, with Janelia, um, um, the group of Carl Svoboda in uh, Nature. I had a large article on, um, on consciousness in Nature. We had a um, transcriptional um, um, atlas um, from Ralf Puchalski of, um, of neoglioblastoma, uh, uh, clinical, of, of great clinical relevance. We had a beautiful paper in Cell uh, based on the um, transgenic tools that Tanya and uh, Linda and Hong Kui's group have generated. We had a, a paper in Neuron that shows specialization of a particular type of RNA current, so-called H current, in, in neurons that, that's found in humans, but not in, in mice. Um, we had several papers in uh, Nature Neuroscience. One, again, that, was, that showed um, um, a beautiful neuron called rose hip neurons in um, superficial in layer one of human cortex, together with a group in, in Hungary. We had a second uh, paper, Nature Neuroscience paper, with Shomo and Clay Reed's group doing viral techniques. Uh, this was together with, uh, with, uh, with MIT. We had a paper in eLife announcing for the first time sort of a systematic or um, a first pilot set of data of a systematic survey of synaptic, um, synaptic connectivities in both human and, um, and mouse. We had several papers in Nature Communications. Uh, uh, about um, modeling, both detailed biophysical accurate models as well as single cell models. We had more papers in announcing the, um, the detailed layer four paper, the, the, the layer four model. We had, pa we had papers describing the, human, um, the uh, human culture, so with lots and lots of publications. We have more papers in the work, particularly to Nature and Nature Neuroscience. So for those of you who may not know, Nature is sort of a um, is sort of the, 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 the highest you can aspire, the highest publication, um, the toughest um, peer review journal to get into. So that's a pretty big deal for us. We have, we have three more that are in, in various stages of, uh, of resubmitting. One concerning the mouse um, hierarchy, a cortex, um, cortical salamic hierarchy. One concerning the human transcriptional work. Uh, there's another one uh, that was submitted on the the morphology, the description of the different uh, cell types in the mouse by, uh, by functional criteria, electrophysiological criteria, as well as by morphological criteria. 
Um, we probe the, the mouse and the uh, human and cells. And again, this human program is really quite unique that we've worked with so many neurosurgeons now and we have rot relatively routine access to neurons and so we can probe them using these fancy techniques that are otherwise only possible in animal experiments where we can get um, all three modalities. So we can recover the morphology of the cell, we can say something about the electrophysiological properties, the functional properties, and we can say something about the transcriptional properties of cells or pairs of cells when we in, in, in octopatching, Tim Jarsky in his group. Um, we've collected, I've, and you'll hear another uh, team talk on this by, um, by Saskia and, and other members of the, of the Visual Coding Brain Observatory Group, uh, um, and that paper is also in, in um, uh, will be resubmitted to Nature in second, sta uh, second stage review. And there, what we discovered is a sparse uh, yet redundant code. Sparse means at any given point in time, only a small fraction are activated, and each cell is only activated by a very specific set of stimuli. That's what sparse means. Um, redundance, overlapping, and this code is very different from the standard uh, textbook, so-called Schubel and Wiesel model, that has sort of a simple series of ascending uh, processing stages from, from early visual cortex to a higher order visual cortex in a, in a monkey. We find something very different. And um, of course, um, we have to thank our founder, who unfortunately, as you all know, couldn't be here. And so what we have to do as the years accumulate and, and we, we, we work hard to achieve his, his goal is really to internalize his vision and internalize his constant drive to excel and to really uh, help us understand um, the brain in both health and disease. With that, I thank you and um, we'll have the uh, next speaker. Thank you very much.